We covered Francis Brett Young's work and biography back in episode 300. Today we will review Francis Brett Young's first novel, his 1913 Undergrowth, written together with his brother Eric. Eric Brett Young was Francis' younger brother. Born around 1893, he was educated at the King Edward School, entering in 1905 with a full scholarship. He was partially disabled, with one leg shorter than the other. He left school in 1910, working for a newspaper in Cornwall, and died in 1931. Eric himself only wrote two novels, The Dancing Beggars and The Murder at Fleet, both murder mysteries. Beside Undergrowth, he collaborated with Francis on a critical study of the poet Robert Bridges, though only Francis' name appears on the book. The story concerns a dam being built in a remote corner of Wales. Already the sparse inhabitants of the hills were forced out, all but the shepherd Morgan, who still remains with his sheep despite being forced out of his ancestral cottage built in the first years of the 18th century. We see the engineer Forsyth arrive to take charge of the construction very suddenly. He assumes his predecessor, Carlion, retired somewhere, but only on sight do they tell him he died. The second in command, Hayward, says he became more and more insubstantial over time, as if one could see through him as he wandered the hills, fascinated in a quite unusual way. Once Hayward even found him lying in the heart of a circle of stones. Forsyth laughs at this, but then the accidents start happening. Many, many accidents, which slow the work and take the lives of many of his workers, who are not happy about it. Then one of the workers is seen stealing sheep to cut them open as a sacrifice upon the stones and another worker, when injured, starts speaking cryptic warnings in Welsh, a language he does not know how to speak. The second man, a friend of Carly, and has visions of an earlier life where he, among fellow Welshmen, was travelling through the forest but was chased away by a most terrible presence. Forsyth still wishes to ignore this, but he cannot ignore his workers trying to burn Morgan alive because he came to curse at them due to their dam desecrating the land. Nor can he ignore the baleful influence of the Stone of Vengeance, the Carrick Dial, which may be seen just outside his house and which caused both Carly and now himself to lose their minds, and that was before the men took the stone and built it from the side of Forsyth's house. While the novel has a fantastic first half, the second half drags, after a typhoid epidemic which does not appear to be nearly as destructive as was feared, the string of bad luck plaguing the dam seems to be over for the most part, and all progress stops so we can explore the inner mental workings of Forsyth, driven to drink and worse by surroundings. Bits of Carlion's cryptic diary, left behind with his things, which before gave some colour to the events, now only hold progress, and their semi-vague philosophy grows a bit tedious after some time. Other characters who established disappear at this point as well, some with more finality than others. But this makes the novel, which had shifted scenes and perspectives before and often, feel even more rooted in the same spot. Sadly, the climax, when it happens, is disconnected from the previous build-up, nor is it given the gravitas it would deserve. It feels like all this build-up of the catastrophic is a bit wasted when not dwelt upon. 